Welcome, friends. I hope you're doing well wherever you may be in whichever part of the world. I do um, thank those of you that have taken the time to join us in fellowship for for doing so. Uh, I know that this is um, a busy time of the year for a lot of people and that many are involved in uh, vacations or um, in enjoying the time that their children have off and vacations and and that a lot of people end up doing a lot of things over the course of what is the early or later part of spring and then also with that of at the beginning of the height of summer. And so a lot of people do um, go on their weekly vacations. And uh, and so anyways, um, today I'm going to cover a topic that a lot of people have asked me about, and I've received a lot of questions on this. And so I want to try to approach this topic in a different way than what I have uh, explained as far as in the past. Because I I feel like I've covered in great detail the war in heaven and also how it was that the fallen angels were cast out and how it is that they ended up being here before the modern creation of humanity. Um, The account that I want to talk about, I think, will be more focused on explaining some of the the Gnostic, I guess maybe the Gnostic side of the story and what I have turned in the my sixth book, The Sons of God, as far as the elevation of humanity once we were cast out, banished from paradise and found here upon the planet. And, in the, you know, of course, the story begins with Adam and Eve because in what I've studied and what I've learned, it's my opinion that when they were created, that they were initially bright-natured, immortal, and angelic beings, and that their um, their fall from grace originated in paradise. And so I'm going to focus a little bit on, on that as well, the difference between What is paradise and what is the Garden of Eden? And I write a lot about this in my fourth book, Lucifer, Father of Cain. There's a chapter in there that talks about the differences between paradise and and the Garden of Eden. And I'm actually going to open that to see if I can... Maybe pull some of that scripture into this discussion, but from what I've gleaned of having studied all of the texts, and again, um, I in no way uh, assert that everything that I say is 100% accurate. I just want to put that out there because there was a, a time when I had considered that the first resurrection was part of what was the millennial reign. And I have since amended my views on that. And so, um, you know, none of us have everything right, and we are all still learning. And I learned a lot from all of you as well in, you know, coming to discernment on so much material because there is so much out there. Okay. And I'll find this particular chapter in just a little bit, but I'll go ahead and open with this, what I consider to be one of the keys for understanding this in fullness. And, um, and I had a question that was posed to me in a discussion from Professor Truth and also a friend of mine, Maria, who has been busy translating my works into Spanish so that I can present them to an entirely different audience, which I'm 
so grateful to her for doing that and for having, you know, done all of that work. I mean, just an incredible amount of work to to um, translate. And she's worked on all three of what are, you know, my major books, The Lucifer, Father of Cain, The Sons of God, and The Skyfall. And so, anyways, I'm just going to read a little bit of this discussion and then we'll talk about what it was, uh, how it was that I had answered, and this will set the premise for um, this particular discussion. And also, I spoke earlier with a, a friend, Miguel, who was interested in, um, he told me that he doesn't even read books, and he read my Sons of God book two times, and that it it answered, and helped him to understand things in a profound manner. And so I was grateful for that, and I am grateful for all of those of you that have been infected in similar manner. And I, it's my hope and my prayer that all of these books affect you in similarity and that they open you at least to new possibility and open you to look into and to study some of what people consider to be extra biblical or extra canonical um, so that you can get greater detail on what is the foundation of the canon. And that's that's my goal in studying these other texts and even in reading, you know, the things that are Masonic or Sumerian or, you know, have to do with... Uh, other bodies of knowledge, and even with the the Sumerian lore, I mean not the Sumerian lore, but with the emerald tablets, things of that nature, which um, which in my mind help us to glean how it is that we came to be here and what we're dealing with as a world, and. It helps to also give us a, a perspective in what I refer to as the prior times um, and those things that happened in the ancient past which led us to be where we are now and that were part of the earlier histories of the planet and this particular solar system. And I've covered that and I've elaborated on all that as well. Um, many times talking about how it was that this planet was destroyed and that one of the moons of Nibiru, the western satellite, or the west wind, and how it was had gutted the planet Rahab, Tiamat, Maldek, and shifted its orbital position to where the Earth is now and that this was all under the control of the Most High. And that this was, that began the next, uh, what began the Earth Chronicles here, the focus of life on this planet. And all of that is talked about in the um, second to sixth day in the Genesis story in the timeline. Because in my opinion, after the Tohu Wabohu or the destruction that made the Earth null and void, that the earth was recreated and that it became hospitable for the multiplicity that we see now upon the planet as far as life and the creatures that are here upon it that were made after their own kind and that uh that the um the father and the son had seeded so anyways let's um Look at this particular text, and I'll check into the chat room. <clears throat> All right. This is a, a letter first from Professor Truth to Maria. He says, uh, the way it works is you will be you, but I do not think that we will have male and female anatomy in our celestial bodies. That it may be possible. We will be who we are, so we may have a resemblance of who we are here, but just glorified. There would be no need for reproduction and no carnal lust in what would be 
our angelic bodies. But I may be in error as I have I also have heard that there are families that existed before the fall. One of my theories I've not talked about was that Eden was a spiritual place, another dimension, and the original Adam and Eve were meant to reproduce in heaven, possibly, and they did, producing us in Eden. And then the fall. I am stretching things. There are some things we are just not told. If God created all of us instantaneously, or we came from Adam and Eve in heaven, and then let her were incarnated into bodies that came from a flesh Adam and Eve, no one knows. I am seeing a lot to say that Adam and Eve of the Bible had two occurrences, one in Eden and another after the fall. And so I was asked to weigh in on this, and the... <clears throat> excuse me... The response that I sent back was, Originally, Adam and Eve were angelic, bright-natured beings, immortal. They did not have sexual organs or relations. The families in heaven have to do with the unity of the sons of God as angelic beings under the Morning Star administration and has nothing to do with procreation and nor did we have sexual organs. And again, this is all my opinion. You are right, um, Professor, that in, uh, the, in paradise, paradise is at the third heaven, and that the beguilement there had to do with wanting to be as gods themselves, resulting in their fall from paradise and banishment to the earth where they were transformed into flesh bodies on what is the eighth day. Uh, Eve was then impregnated with Cain, and you know, all of this that I am speaking about here is detailed in my book, Sons of God. And so I'm going to start with this and then elaborate and if you have any questions as to whether I'm not clarifying something, um, something not making sense, then feel free to post something in the chat room. Um, but I'm going to try to, like I said, cover this from a little bit different angle and focus on the fall and what was the beginning of the Second World Age. So... In my mind, everything that we're going to cover is spoken of and that this one paragraph from On the Origin of the World, which is a um, Nag Hammadi text, what people would say, uh, Gnostic, this one paragraph, this one particular passage, serves as key for understanding the different world ages and also the three stages of life and embodiment. And when I say the three stages of life and embodiment, I'm speaking of our spiritual embodiment before we were incarnated into flesh form, that this had to do with who we were as the sons of God, as part of the angels within the first world age and that the who after the fall and then our spirits being merged with what was the flesh body and that's who we find ourselves now as and and that we find ourselves in a fallen state of being in a fallen world and that this world age will not end until Christ comes again um, for the second resurrection and that that part will occur with the harvest with the parable of the wheat and the tares the goat and the sheep 
that all that uh, that happens on the last day, last Trump, last day, in my opinion. And so, and then um, when we are raised and our bodies are raised and we are given our crowns and um, and we find ourselves in our glorified bodies, that this represents the millennial reign or third world age and what is the return to our first estate. And that this particular passage that I'm about to read from uh, talks about these three states of being as being spirit, soul, and then dust. It says this. Now the first Adam, Adam of light, which this is Yahushua, in my opinion, the the son who was the visible embodiment of the the Father, just as it says in John 1, everything was made through the Word. He and His Father are one. And that uh, nothing was done that was not done through them. Now the first Adam, Adam of light, is spirit endowed and appeared on the first day that there's references to all of the angels being created um, and that the Father, when he, you know, called forth the light, that that was the revealing of Yeshua, even though he was not created in that moment. He had already pre-existed with the Father and pre-existed any other aspect of creation. And in fact, Creation is um, creation is a part of who is the Father and the Son, and that all things have their source in them. All right, read this again. Now the first Adam, Adam of light, is spirit endowed and appeared on the first day. The second Adam is soul endowed and appeared on the sixth day. The soul endowed Adam, sixth day. That's when Adam and Eve were made and that they were made in paradise. The third Adam is a creature of the earth that is the man of the law. And he appeared on the eighth day. The tranquility of poverty, there's a, a part of the passage is broken off and missing. So there's a, appeared on the eighth day, and then there's a fragmented part of the text. And then it says, the tranquility of poverty, which is called the day of the sun, or Sunday, and the progeny of the earthly Adam, the children born unto Adam became numerous and was completed and produced within itself every kind of scientific information of the soul endowed Adam. But all were in ignorance. So, the soul endowed Adam was this Adam that appeared on the eighth day. And that this particular day, after the Sabbath, first day after the, after the Sabbath, which would be, if you go back, would be on Sunday, that um, that there was a, a recreation of this Adam into what would be flesh form, or what would be the soul endowed Adam, the Adam created on the sixth day that was recreated, placed into a body of flesh. The And notice here, um, the third Adam is a creature of the earth, that is the man of the law, and he appeared on the eighth day. And then it says that, and the progeny of the earthly Adam 
became numerous and was completed and produced within itself every kind of scientific information of the soul in doubt, Adam, but all were in ignorance. Meaning that even though they learned everything that they could about the fallen Adam, the flesh Adam, Adam of dust, the eighth day Adam transformed into flesh, that still everybody was in ignorance. And in my opinion, again, I'm going to go to the chat. In my opinion, the ignorance that was created is because nobody remembered from whence they had fallen. And nobody could recall, because of the cup of forgetfulness, nobody could recall or remember that we had being, that we had prior embodiment as spiritual beings and that we were part of the sons of God in heaven. And that our lives did not begin just with our coming here to this planet and taking on flesh form. All right, hold on just a second. All right, I'm going to look real quick. See if I can find it. The chapter on... Paradise. Okay. All right, and I have also I, I've been asked about how I know when the fallen angels had fallen and when they were cast out, when the war in heaven was. And you can find that in chapter 29. Oh, sorry. In chapter 30 of the Book of the Secrets of Enoch. And that. There's reference to it occurring on the second day in that particular text. All right. All right. Um, okay. Um, let me just comment since I, I can't find what it is. I'm, I'm looking for directly. Um, there, there's several references, and you can find this in the Vision of Paul, also in the books of Enoch, number one and two. There's references to paradise, and there's also another passage that speaks about how paradise had been laid even before the creation of the earth and um, you know, this particular part of the solar system that paradise was already in existence. And that when Christ died on the cross, that he, when he died on the cross, he went down into Sheol, and that he spent three days in Sheol, well, not 
all of them in Sheol, but that he went down and broke open the gates of hell, the what's referred to as the bars of iron, the gates of brass, and that he um, then took in resurrection all those that had died from Adam to the thief in the cross back up into paradise and that this was the first resurrection. There's also, I was asked, why doesn't it refer to women when in this particular resurrection? And I, I don't know why that is exactly. Uh, it's, you know, it's my opinion that Salvation is not solely for the male alone, in that you know every, that both genders have equal part to play within both the first resurrection and what will be the second resurrection, which will occur when Christ comes again for His bride, and that the wise and the foolish virgins include both male and female, those that are the elect and those that are not um, and that a lot of us have great part in determining whether we will be worthy uh, by whether we trim our wigs and prepare our oil all right Now, there's another couple of passages in both the Cave of Treasures and the first book of Adam and Eve that talk about how Adam and Eve were created in Oh, well, I'm glad that you could join us, Word Searcher and Carol. I appreciate all of you that have joined and the many guests that are anonymous and remain numbered. Um... Okay, and so paradise, when they were created in paradise, the eating of the fruit, the the begotment that took place in paradise, in my opinion, is that they wanted to be as gods themselves and that they were uh, deceived by the Nakash into desiring what they did not have. And that eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil caused them to be recreated on the eighth day into bodies of flesh. And that um, the Gnostic texts go into great detail. They speak about, um, they they focus and speak about on the creation of the visible universe. They don't necessarily talk a, a whole lot or in great detail about what are referred to as the imperishable realms and where the Most High, the the Father and the Son uh, reside in the upper heavens. Their focus is on the the fall of Sophia, which Sophia, for those that don't know, represents wisdom and knowledge, and that, um, and on an individual name Yaldabaoth, which means child passed through here, and that that is the the thing that Sophia called this particular being that came to be head and over the visible realms, what the Gnostics refer to as the fallen realms. And this is where we are now, the third dimensional reality, physical realm, but there are some some aspects of the fallen visible world which are beyond what we see in third dimensional form and reality. And that 
some of the interdimensional beings that are referred to in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, as well as other texts that these so-called, like the ancient aliens, the fallen angels, that, you know, some of them are still in this interdimensional space, um, and some are inhabiting bodies of flesh and working through the flesh, and they are possessing form, um, that some of that higher space, just because these beings are in a dimension above ours, does not mean they are benevolent and good and of the upper heavens, which only the angels of the Most High can go to. It, uh, there's talk about the various heavens and that the fallen angels can take form and hold embodiment on what are the lower five heavens. And that even on the third heaven, that there where paradise is, there's a a gulf. There's a a, a, a split, a divide between the place of the elect and the place of the um the wicked that you will find angels on both the left and the right hand as is spoken of in the second book of Enoch and also the ascension of Isaiah that you will find angels of the left which are the wicked angels and angels on the right which are the good angels in all of the heavens going up to the fifth heaven and then once you get to the sixth heaven which is the divine that you find only angels on the right, that none of the wicked angels are allowed into the upper heavens, that they are cast out of the upper heavens. Um, and uh, if you read those two books, The Ascension of Isaiah as well as the the second book of Enoch, it gives great detail. It speaks about the Grigori, which are the fallen angels, the the ones that were cast out, and how they were weeping because they no longer have part in salvation, and that they can no longer supplicate the Lord in prayer, and that um, they know that they are condemned, and they know that they are going to be judged but that they are dedicated to wickedness and evil in in uncertain degree so that none of the children, none of the sons of God that are in form and in flesh embodiment would inherit those ordinances and those places that they had abandoned in lusting after the daughters of humanity and the daughters of Cain and of not wanting to serve, but of wanting to rule. Just like Lucifer talks about in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, where he says, I will exalt my, you know, I will exalt, I will this, I will that, uh, I will place my um, throne in the side of the north, all those different things. He's basically telling you his agenda and his will for being here in the flesh and what he and his fallen angels are wanting to do. And I was, um, uh, actually I answered earlier, this particular person that had commented on one of my YouTube videos about how uh, she was basically, you know, ridiculing me and making fun of me and saying that um, I didn't know what I was talking about, and that the Anunnaki angels, that even the angels of the Old Testament, that Yahweh was one of the Anunnaki angels, and that the Anunnaki are our creators. And, you know, because I, I get so much of that. And, and, you know, I honor people for where they are and that they, believe as they believe but 
I responded that, you know, I had been in the tw new, new Age movement for 20 years myself. I had studied everything that she has studied that led her to that conclusion. And I used to believe similarly. Um, and I used to be involved in um, the study and the the focus of Sumerian teachings and how I even made fun of way back then, you know, Christians and because my mother was also a Christian and my father too and um, and I made fun of their belief systems. I was, you know, telling them about all this new information that was coming out and and that um, we had learned better and different. But having been brought full circle and having studied everything in its entirety, I know now that the Anunnaki angels are nothing more than the angels of the Most High that are just parading around as gods themselves. And that the Sumerian teachings and much of the other paganist, idolatrous teachings which worship the pantheon of gods and uh, the n feathered serpent or the Nakash or dragons and you know things of that sort, that they are trying to lead people astray and they are trying to get people to believe in similar similar aspect and that they want us. To believe that the ancient aliens are our gods and that that is the reason why we have the gospel which warns us about the strong delusion and also warns us about the fallen angels and the things that they did, how they had even tried to lead us astray so long ago and that they are continually still trying to lead us astray to this day and that they basically told Adam that uh, we don't know when it is you will be saved from us, but it is our good pleasure to multiply murder upon you and your descendants until that day arrives. Okay, so going back to the story that leads to what is the eighth day, Adam, Adam of Paradise. According to the text, that when Adam is banished here to the earth, that, um, well, first I have to talk about this as well that in the story that there is a reflection of Adam and light that beams down from the heavens upon what are the waters of the earth and the the angels the you know that cuz they are in the atmosphere and they um you know that's why they call satan the prince of the air is because they have reign of the five heavens below the upper heavens and so these angels, they all saw this reflection of what was the perfect being. Um, and, you know, we're made in God's image. So it was an image of the sun reflected upon the waters of the earth. And they saw this beautiful, angelic, and uh, incredibly perfect being reflected in the waters. Adam of light, who we are made in the image of. Adam of paradise was made in the image of Adam of light. And so when they saw this image reflected into the waters, they wanted to capture this being. They wanted to have this being under their authority, under their control. And they wanted them to have to come down to their realms, 
and be under their control. And they were lustful. They were lustful. And that uh, they didn't care, you know, as far as male or female gender. They just wanted this being to be captured so that they could proliferate, also control and manipulate and um, do as they wish with it. And the story goes that they were instructed by the angels of the Most High and that the angels of the heavens as well as the lower angels that they had um, worked together to create what was a modeled form, a clay figure for the the being that they saw reflected in the waters to inhabit and to animate and that the being that they had created came together as a creation of both the the angels of the Most High as well as the angels of the lower order, the demons, and that um, after they had created the being and they were scared of it because they knew two things. They knew, one, that the being they saw reflected in the waters would send his children to live through this particular flesh form and that uh, later the true man of light, as Christ is referred to, that he would also come into the flesh and that he would trample upon their dominion and that he would defeat death and that he would destroy their kingdom and the counterfeit nature of their kingdom. And so... In Sons of God, I speak about how this particular modeled form was allowed to lay on the ground for 40 days. That it was um, it was not animated, had no life, couldn't stand up, it couldn't do anything on of its on its own, had no consciousness it was not really a crafted per se living being that it was only um clay it was dust dirt it was um a body that had come about as um for what would be the Adam um, of paradise. And so this particular body, you know, laid on the ground for 40 days, and then suddenly Christ blew the spirit of Adam into it. And this is Adam of paradise that had fallen with his wife Eve um, that According to the text, I'm not, you know, interjecting my opinion here, but according to the text that Eve was not yet, that she would come uh, in a little bit later because they would also create a form for her as well that that would hold her soul. But anyways, um, and so Adam of Paradise sixth day Adam of Paradise now found himself in this clay model form and that his spirit was merged with this particular um, body which is a flesh body same as what we have here and that all of this was under the control and under the authority of Christ because he knew that he was going to also come in and to take form and to hold form later in one of these um, bodies 
and that he was going to destroy the work of the archons or the fallen angels, that he would defeat death and that he would be able then to extend salvation to whomever he wanted to and whoever he desired. And so, uh, Yaldabaoth, who is also referred to as Sakloth, the blind god, and also to Samael, the angel of death, he is the individual that was head of the seraphim angels. And it talks about this uh, in the, also in the Gnostic text. We know him to be Lucifer or Satan. A lot of people so-called Gnostic experts, they actually teach that Yadavoth is Yahweh of the Old Testament, citing that you know, he's homicidal and genocidal in the Old Testament. He tells people to kill even children. And so they're they're trying to you know, they say and they assert that Yadavoth is Yahweh, but in my opinion they're completely wrong. It's absolutely, even in Gnostic texts, it tells us that Yaldabaoth is Sakloth and Samael, and we know those to be references to the Nakash. And that also speaks about how he was head of the Seraphim angels, which are the dragon angels. And we know uh, who that is, Revelation 12, that ancient serpent, that old dragon that deceiveth the whole world. And so it's my opinion that a lot of people that read the Gnostic test don't know what they're talking about and that this story that I'm speaking of, they are trying to equate to the fall that's related in Genesis chapter 3. But that, in my opinion, these are two separate events that the fall reflects the um, the sixth day and that what I call the elevation or that um, you know, humanity being reminded of where we had fallen from that this occurred on the eighth day and that it talks about how um, uh, Sophia her daughter Zoe which means life Sophia means wisdom that she was the one that had brought forth Yaldabaoth and created the visible realms. But all this, again, was under the the direction of the Most High God. And it even talks about that in the text. Um, and that all this was for purpose. And that purpose was to give us a chance to realign ourselves for the war in heaven and the things that occurred there in our first spiritual embodiments, and that we would have this lifetime in the flesh to redetermine and to prove whether we truly wanted to know about the deeper aspects of life and come to know our Creator, and also that the Creator has a Son and that the Son came into the flesh and defeated death and offered to, to us a, a way out, salvation. And that if we follow his commandments and his example, that we can be counted and that we make priority of the kingdom and that we do the works that he would wish us to do, that we can be counted among the righteous and the elect. And so all of that... Um, is cited and spoken about. But going back to the details of the story of the the elevation, it talks about how the so-called gods, when Adam was animated and that he was brought to life here on this planet by Yahushua and given the spirit of Adam of paradise, in his flesh embodiment, that he became the same being, that he was wiser than the gods who were around him because the gods were the fallen angels, and that Sophia then said, 
sent Zoe, which, you know, I talked about how there was also a female form that was created and that did not have life that, like Adam, remained in a, um animated state. But that Zoe life, which means life, she descended from the heavens and took up in Eve's embodiment, in the form of the female, the counterpart of Adam, and that she began to instruct Adam about where he had fallen from. Now, I know that uh, those of you that are only um, King James Version readers, that this will not make any kind of sense because most of you have not read the Gnostic text and do not know about the um, this other aspect, this other episode, and what is being referred to in the Nag Hammadi Codices. And so if you read my sixth book, Sons of God, I've aligned all of them to show you and to share with you the bigger story. Because if you just read the Nakamati Codices for yourself, you're going to read um, 50 different texts that all have small parts of what is the bigger story. And I actually broke all of those stories and those pieces and those parts, separated them, and aligned them into one huge, big story, big tale. And um, I aligned them so that they would tell and we would be able to understand the bigger picture of what was being referenced, what was being spoken about in the Nag Hammadi Codices. And that's when I, that's when I come to find out and that's when I understood them as being a completely different episode that they are not talking about the imperishable realms, which, you know, in Genesis 1, we have the uh, generations of the heavens and the earth, and the earth was recreated. But the Gnostic text, even though they speak about the upper heavens and the imperishable realms, and um, their focus is on the fallen earth and also on what are referred to as the archons which are the fallen angels, the Anunnaki, all the same things, the same phenomena. All right. Um, I'm actually, uh, I'll read a passage real quick that Christ refers to the archons. This is from the letter to, of Peter to Philip. It says, it is because of this that you are being detained, which are being detained is being in the flesh embodiment, because you belong to me. When you strip off from yourselves what is corrupted, that is the flesh form, then you will become illuminators in the midst of mortal men. When we identify with who we really are, that spiritual aspect of ourselves and we not ignore the carnal but that we don't only identify with that that we know that we're angels in flesh embodiment and that we are immortal bright natured beings and that our flesh bodies are just what we are going to wear for this lifetime and this is the reason that you will fight against the powers, because they do not have rest like you, since they do not wish that you be saved. Then the apostles worshipped again, saying, Lord, tell us, in what way shall we fight against the archons, since the archons are above us? Then a voice called out to them from the appearance, saying, now you will fight against them in this way. For the archons are fighting against the inner man. That's that spiritual aspect of ourselves. 
that part of us that is the connecting link to the creator, our angelic embodiment that holds form in our physical bodies, that we must remember who we are. And you are to fight against them in this way. Come together and teach in the world the salvation with a promise. And you, gird yourselves with the power of my Father, and let your prayer be known. And he, the Father, will help you as he has helped me. Oh, as he has helped you by sending me. Be not afraid. I am with you forever, as I previously said to you when I was in the body. Then there came lightning and thunder from heaven, and what appeared to them in that place was taken up to heaven. And so another thing that is interesting about the Nag Hammadi codices, which I didn't make mention of earlier, is that these teachings are from a time after Christ's resurrection and after the first resurrection when he took all of the souls that were in Sheol, the, those that were the righteous and the elect, took them into paradise and he took them back to um, uh, back up into the third heaven. And so, and these are also the teachings where Christ said, I will not uh, speak in parables, but I'm going to tell you plainly about the things that had occurred, about who you're fighting against, the archons, the fallen angels, and about how you should, you know, be while you're here in the flesh, how you should focus on the kingdom, who... Um, those teachings which help us to remember our our pre-existence and that we are angelic beings and that you know we find ourselves in fallen flesh form and that we are under the authority of the fallen angels the archons the anunnaki whatever it is you want to call them and that the uh the next part of the agenda is to deceive us and to lead, lead the entirety of the world astray because they want all of us to not have any part in salvation and to not have a return to our first estate. And so and they're you know they're going to unveil the antichrist They're going to unveil the Antichrist as um, as God, as Yahushua, and that those that are not grounded within the scriptures, that do not understand the deeper aspects of it, will easily be confused and be led astray, just like that one girl that um, you know, she was basically talking about how the Anunnaki are our gods and how um, how Yahweh was also one of the Anunnaki and that, you know, and I've covered all of that as well. I've talked about Enlil and Enke because so many people believe that uh, Enlil is Yahweh and that Enke is uh, is you know an, another god, and in my opinion, like the the Gnostics or the Gnostic experts that say that Yaldabaoth is Yahweh, is that they they are confused. That even the Sumerian texts they speak about the creator of all, even them. And that they cite this in their passages as well. Um, but, you know, people that believe the Anunnaki are our gods, they ignore that part of the Sumerian scriptures because they don't want to believe in, an, you know, uh, a creator god. 
but only the fallen angels, that they were our creators. All right. All right, so I was telling you about the story of um, Zoe coming down and being part of being the instructor to Adam that she took up resonance in this female model form, this body that both the angels of the Most High and the angels of the uh, the fallen angels, the angel, the demons under Yadabat, that they work together. And that's why we have a binary, um, like a dual nature, that we have this good and evil within us that if we choose to be evil, we certainly can be, or that if we choose to be good, we most certainly can be as well, that there is this contest. Just as it talks about in the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, mandate number six, that talks about the angel of righteousness and the angel of unrighteousness, and that both are within us, and that depending on who we focus upon and who we give our time our space and our effort too is how it is that we will be. Whether we follow the commandments, all those kind of things as well. And so, um, Zoe was here instructing Adam about the fall and basically telling uh, telling Adam that the same way as the way of ascent is same as the way of descent, meaning that how we came to be in fallen flesh form, that the way to a return to our first estate is the same kind of way. It's a return to paradise, a return to immortality, a return to our bright nature. And that... Um, that involves knowing our Creator and knowing Christ because He's the way, the truth, and the salvation. And the purpose of His coming into the flesh is to show us the way home and to also to show that, um, that, the, that the Most High, the Father of us all, loved us so much that he would even send his only begotten son to die in the flesh, to be treated in the way that he was treated, not deserving to be crucified as a sinless and an innocent man, that he was murdered, and that all of this was prophesied so that he could defeat death, and that through his resurrection we would know that he is the way home. And so this is the part that those who embrace that the Anunnaki are our creators or that the fallen angels are the creators of humanity, they don't know that Christ and the Father are one. And they don't know that what his life and his example and his coming into flesh means for us. And that that was all part of the plan. And that all this, you know, it, it says that the Father knows the end from the beginning. Christ, too, knew this, the end from the beginning. And he knew what he would have to do, and he knew what was coming. That's why in the Gospels, in the Scriptures, it, it talks about, you know, not my will, Lord, but yours, speaking to the Father. And that he knew he had to bear this cup. All right. Um So continuing, let me check with the 
if you have questions. Okay, there's a, a question, which book talks about Enlil, Enki, and the Anunnaki? Uh, my book, Sons of God, that I talk about this in great detail. And basically, um, it's my opinion that Enlil is not Yahweh, but that he represents Zeus, and that Enki represents Poseidon. And remember how um, Enki means Lord of the Waters, and that uh, he was Lord of the Earth, and that when Enlil, because he was the first to arrive here, according to the Sumerian scriptures, he was here before his brother was sent on a, 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 a next mission. And that when Enlil, which he was called Lord of the Command, when he came here, he assumed authority over all of the Anunnaki and that he was the um, closest as far as as far as blood and DNA to Anu who was the father of the king of Nibiru and that Enki came first and he he was the one that is also known as Oanes and Dagon in the Old Testament. But again, it's my opinion that he is Neptune and Poseidon and that he was the one that was relocated when Enlil came here. Um, uh, Enlil, they drew straws. The, the two brothers as well as the father, Anu, they drew straws and they decided to allow fate to decide who was going to be over what, and when uh, when Enki Ea, it was his name when he first arrived here. That when Ea first arrived here, he had he was the one that established Eridu, and that Eridu was up there in like the Mediterranean in that area, area, and that um, that when Enlil came, they had this discrepancy. They, Enlil was going to take charge, and they knew that they were going to have to move their area of focus to South America because that's where they were going to garnish the most gold, and that the focus for their mission here was to to gather gold so that they could crush it into powder form, suspend it in the air, into the atmosphere on their planet to stave off the destructive rays of um, the sun when they came close to it in orbit. And so that was the focus of their mission. That's why we always have the stories of the so-called gods and goddesses uh, being focused on gold. And that's why we have very ancient minds and that these minds were established by the fallen ones even before the creation of modern humanity. And that even with their efforts in creating a primitive worker, the slave race, that that was their goal, was to gather the gold. And so Anki, because when, when um, Enlil came here, he took on a different name. They gave him a different title. And so he relocated to the Abzu, or what is South Africa, South uh, Africa, the continent of Africa. That was his domain. And that Enlil took over the area near the Mediterranean. Uh, but instead of taking over Eridu, which was the first base and called the home in the faraway. He instead created Baalbek, or, you know, the focus was on Lebanon, and um, that he established his own residence in that area, and that he was known as Zeus or Jupiter. And that the, their father, Anu, he was 
he drew they drew straws and he was to go back and to hold kingship over um the planet Nibiru. And so he went back and left his two sons here, Enlil and Enke, and that it, it's my opinion that they are the the two foremost of the pantheon of the fallen angel gods, the um, the Zeus and Poseidon, and or what is a uh, Jupiter and Neptune. And so anyways, all all the names of Enki are found in in my sixth book Sons of God cuz I I didn't want you to get de- deceived. He's also the one known as Enki is also the one known as Ptah in the uh Egyptian lore. And that Ptah was the father of Ra. Uh, Yes, I do. There's another question. Do I think that they are here now or that they will come back for the false rapture? Um, I do believe that they are here now and that they are the ones that are um, seeding what would be knowledge of a false rapture. And when I say false rapture, or just uh, one that, you know, they say that there's going to, some say that there's going to be one that happens before uh, the tribulation and that um, the church will take and be taken out and not have to undergo any kind of trial or tribulation here upon the planet. Now, when I say trial and tribulation, I'm not talking about the wrath of God. Now, the wrath of God in the day of the Lord, uh, it's my opinion that all of that happens last Trump, last day, and that the wrath of God is then poured out on those that are aligned with the fall, uh, fallen angels, that believe the strong delusion, and that believe the Anunnaki are our gods or goddesses, that they are our creators, and that they, um, and, and those that take the mark of the beast. And it's my opinion that the wrath of God is reserved only for those not written into the book of life. You're welcome. All right. Let me get back to this story because we're quickly running out of time. All right, so anyways, um, there is a story of what was the tree of good here upon this planet. And that the Most High had caused Adam and Eve to eat from this tree so that they could see that they were in a fallen state and that they were no longer in paradise and that they were in a fallen world where they were surrounded by devils and demons. And that understanding this, they knew that they were even smarter than and and blessed more than the fallen angels. And that they should not worship the fallen angels as their gods. And that they should separate from them. And that they knew that they were going to have to be here upon this planet for the time that was allotted to them until um, until Christ came into the flesh, because even when Adam was cast out of paradise, banished from the uh, from the upper heavens, banished from you know paradise to the to the earth. Uh, and that they lost their immortal, bright-natured form, that they were given a prophecy of how Christ would come into the flesh, how the Son of the Most High, of the Creator, He would come into the flesh and take on the same form as they were wearing 
and that they were dressed in, and that he would defeat death, and that when he defeated death, um, when he was crucified and died on the cross, and that he would be raised. But in the three days when he would come down into Sheol and break open the gates of iron, the, the bars of iron and brass, and free all of them that were righteous and take them back into paradise. Oh, and I, you know, I had made mention of why there was no women um, mentioned. Mary is actually mentioned as being in paradise in, in the um, vision of Paul. And there, and, and so, and I think that the reason that there are not a lot of women uh, mentioned is that with the first resurrection, all of the supposed heroes or the patriarchs, it, it fell upon the men to be heads of the household. And that Mary, she was definitely one of these uh, characters that was absolutely righteous and being chosen to be the mother of God, I can see why it was that she was uh, spoken of as being with the saints, uh, the saints that were that took part in the first resurrection. And so, you know, this, and again, um, why individuals like Deborah and other women leaders, people like Thecla, um, are not mentioned, I have no idea. Uh, but it is my opinion that both genders are found in paradise. And that it's, you know, not just a male thing. But anyways, saying that, um, yeah, I forgot the other point that I was trying to make. Uh, okay, anyways, we're going to run out of time. So I'm going to just make one final commentary, and I just want to thank all of you that have joined us and that are, you know, sharing commentary and asking questions in the chat room. I, I do appreciate all of you, and I will be on Revolution Radio this this Wednesday again from 8 to 10 p.m. And that I am focused right now, just so you know what my um, what I'm doing, I am creating a second printing and a second edition of Lucifer, Father of Cain. And that also, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the show, my friend, uh, my friend Mar Maria is translating all my books, or at least three of my books, those that are the most read into Spanish so that I can provide them to entirely, you know, different audience and that um, we'll be able to make this available hopefully soon. And that once, you know, once they are translated, I'm going to have to format them and, and, you know, make them align right and make all the, uh, page pages the passages fit right so that they'll uh, th so that the book will read right and the chapter breaks and all that and then you know put that together with the uh, with the covers and 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 then we'll be able to make that available to people especially those of you if you know um, if you know other Spanish speaking, you have families, friends, loved ones, or even, you know, different parts of the world that uh, can benefit from this, that we are definitely in the process of trying to make that available. But as far as the second edition of Lucifer, uh, I am adding passages and that I am changing certain things and adding to certain things so that we can so that it will read and they also be more informative and that I'm adding uh, verses as far as the different source material 
so that it will be easier, easierly, or more easily read by those of you that are trying to study and to to read them and to look into them. And I do um, recommend those of you that can to if if you are just studying one or two of my books that. If you can, out of the seven, if you can only just read three, The Lucifer Father Came, The Sons of God, and also Skyfall, and read them in that order, that it's my opinion they will bless your life and help you to come to discernment on some of these um, seemingly difficult concepts. And so, and then also, you know, you can always ask me questions. Um, if you have a number of different questions, know that I will probably get you to send your phone number to me so that I can talk to you by phone uh, so that I can answer and, you know, anything else you want to ask me. Because I, I, I just can't do a whole lot of typing. I'm already doing a lot of typing just and I still have three books laid out that I, I want to focus on and and work on and, and get out to all of you as well. Um, and so I'll be working on those soon as well. But anyways, we'll see everybody Wednesday. I pray that the Most High bless all of you, keep you safe, and enjoy the weather, everyone. And get out there and Take some time to laugh, uh, to not always be serious, to find joy in the day and in every moment. Hug your loved ones. Tell them that you love them. This could be our last day. I mean, we're not guaranteed any more tomorrows. God bless all. Good night.